Come on, let's give the Lord a good hand. Come on, keep clapping a little bit. I want to feel your energy. Let me feel your energy. How many know energy is important? Energy is important. It's, it's, it's movement. It's momentum. I'm saying that word momentum because that's what I felt when I came down the stairs. I felt momentum in this place. Momentum is a force, right? When you have momentum, you have a, you have a force that is driving you. You know, I was thinking when, when we're little kids, we have a lot of momentum. You ever see a five-year-old? A five-year-old has a lot of momentum. They have a lot of movement. A teacher doesn't walk into a classroom filled with five-year-olds and say, Come on, turn it up. The teacher doesn't have to tell five-year-olds to turn it up because they're already turned up. Because they have momentum within their life. And that's what I feel here this morning. I feel this church is alive. I feel people here got momentum in their life. Come on, somebody. And that's what it's going to take to get to the next level that God has for our life. It takes momentum. I want to thank Sister Vicky for this opportunity and Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul is my good friend. You know, I've been in the ministry now 28 years. I'm also uh, I'm a product of the men's home, but also but also a graduate of the UTC. Many moons ago, 1999, I was in the UTC there in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And that's where God really did a work in my life. And um, so, yeah, I'm praying for Lily that she's going to get all the finances to go out there and be blessed. Amen. But I, I love your pastor so much. We've been texting back and forth. I know he's there in the States. And we've had some laughs on the phone this past week, and what can I say about Pastor Paul, man? He's a original, right? <laughs> right? Your pastor, your pastor's an original. Amen. Such a good man, and uh, what a privilege it is to speak here this morning. But God gave me a word. God gave me a word for the church, but just so you get used to my style, I like smiles. Because you can't be happy and look like this. Watch. I'm happy, Pastor, on the inside. Now let it come out on the outside. Especially if you paid a lot of money for your teeth. You got to smile, right? Cost money. I like energy. I'm going to say it again. I like energy. I'm 53, but I got a lot of energy. I got spunk. I got zeal. Come on, somebody. And it's going to be good this morning. Amen. Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I think they're going to put the scripture up. I'm going to do a little bit of reading. We're going to read all the way from verse 1 through 17. Amen? Can you put it back up? Joshua 3, starting in verse 1. I hope you have it because I was relying on the screen. Okay. Early the next morning, never mind. Here we go. Early the next morning, Joshua and the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped, be where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, catch that, leave that up there. Since you have never traveled this way before, 
Leave the scripture up there for a minute. God was going to take them to a place that they've never been before. Right? That's what the scripture says. Since you've never traveled this way, since you've never been this way before, they will guide you. Stay about a half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you did not come any closer. Next verse. Then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priest, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give this commandment to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gershites, all the ites. Come on, somebody. He'll drive them all out ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. We've got a few more verses. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the Ark of the Lord and the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, pay attention to that. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of the water will be cut off upstream, and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan, and the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. A few more verses. It was a harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing in its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the Ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above the point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed on the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. I was going to read two verses, but I thought it was important to read the whole story. Lord Jesus, bless this time, the preaching and the teaching of your word. Let it land on good ground today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give him one more big hand? Just one more, one more. Energetic. Smile. The children of Israel are about to cross the Jordan into the promise that God had given them. They come a long way, the children of Israel. But now they were getting ready to step into the promise that God had for their life. It was a miracle that got them out of something, and it was going to be a miracle that was going to get them into the next level. It was a miracle that they were set free from bondage. Come on, somebody. It, It was a miracle that they were set free and they set out on a journey to possess the promise that God had promised to Moses. And it was going to be a miracle that allowed them to actually step in to what God had said 
he was going to do within their life. How many agree with me? So now Joshua was faced with a big dilemma. And the dilemma was going to be how was he going to lead a group of people of about 1.3 million people. Come on, somebody. He was going to have to lead a big group of people into their promise. But what stood before the promise was a river. And when they got to the river, it seemed like it was going to be impossible to cross through the river to be able to obtain the promise that God had for them. That's, that's good teaching already. How was Joshua going to do this? How was Joshua going to get the people to cross the river that was flowing? The Bible says it was flowing high. It was actually overflowing the banks. The water was rough. When you started that scripture, it was in the season of Nisan. So what that means is the ice that was on the mountains was drying up. So the water was running down into the Jordan River. And it was overflowing. It was out of control. Come on, somebody. And now there's Joshua. He's got about a million, 1.3 million people with him that are waiting to step into their promise. But now they are facing an obstacle. How many know sometimes in our walk with God, before we step into the promise, that there will be times that we may be faced with obstacles? I've always asked God, God, why don't you just do it? You're God. Just, why don't you just go ahead and do it? Why, why does there seem to always have to be a challenge? Come on, somebody. Just make it happen. You're God. But sometimes there's a challenge. There's a, there's a process. Come on now. We've been pastoring now, my wife and I, for 16 years in Las Vegas, and the church is growing. There's a lot of great things that are happening, but there was a process. Come on now. There was a process to see that work established. There was a, there was a process to launch out another church. There was a process to become a regional. There was a process to see my children get saved. There was a, a process. Come on, somebody. That even though the promise is there, Sometimes there is an obstacle in front of the promise. For some people, it's their upbringing. Come on, somebody. We hear great messages. We'll, we'll hear great teaching, and we'll be like, well, that might be for somebody else. That, that's probably not for me because of our mentality, the, the way we think. I used to think like that when I first went to the men's home. When I went to the men's home, I just wanted to get off drugs. I just wanted to work at Home Depot. If you don't know what Home Depot is, it's a warehouse store. My mom worked at Home Depot. My sister worked at Home Depot. My cousins worked at Home Depot. So I said, I just want to get off drugs so that I can work at Home Depot. Because of the mentality. So my upbringing, the way of thinking, the way, the way we're used to living, come on, or I'm too old, I'm getting older in age, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to obtain the promise that God gave to me, come on now. My neck hurts, my back hurts, come on now. My knees are going out, I, you know, I'm hunched over a little bit, I don't, I don't know if I'm physically able to obtain the promise that God gave to me. My health is not that good. Come on, I'm talking to somebody. If I was a little bit healthier, then, then maybe I would pursue the promise that God has for me. These are things that we face. These can be big things in our life that make the promise seem impossible to obtain. But I thank God for Joshua. Joshua was a great leader. Joshua was able to see a possible thing happening even, even though it looked impossible. 
Joshua went to the water. He didn't say, man, it's going to be impossible to cross. He looked at the water and said, the water may be high. These things may be in front of us. We may be facing certain things, but we serve a God of the impossible. Can somebody clap a little bit this morning? I'm just, I'm just getting turned up. The impossible is very possible The impossible is very possible. That was Joshua's mentality. I'm trying to help somebody this morning because I really believe in my spirit that some of you are going to cross over. Okay, four of you. Some of you are going to cross over. You, you've been on this side of the, of the river too long. You've been looking at your promise too long. You've been seeing your promise in a distance for too long. But this morning, God is saying, I'm going to get you to cross over into the promise. The promise for your life, the promise for this church, the promise for Manchester, the promise for Dublin. Somebody is getting ready to cross over. If you don't want to stay where you're at. Sister Vicky, you're right. I got hot. I'm going to take my jacket off. She told me, you're going to get hot. I'm like, no, I'm not. I should have listened. I was just trying to show off my coat I bought in New York. Gonna cross over. Look at your neighbor and say, get ready to cross over. The Bible says, the way I was with Moses, I will be with you, Joshua. The way God was with your pastors, the way God has been with your leaders, the way God has been with our movement, the same God will be with you. Get ready to cross, to cross over. I couldn't be trusted with $5 in food stamps. I don't know if you know what that is. In America, they have a thing, it's food stamps. When you're poor, they, get, they send your mom fake money. It looks like Monopoly money. And you take that and you buy groceries with it when you're poor. My mom couldn't trust me with $5 in food stamps. But I crossed over. And now we're getting ready to buy a building over $7 million. <laughs> How does that happen? Because you cross over. Because you say the promise is possible. Crossover. God gave Joshua the plan. And the plan was the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, it would be the presence. Somebody catch this, please. It would be the presence of God that would lead them across the Jordan into their promise. Because it had been God back in Egypt who had set them free under the, under the control of Pharaoh. It was the presence of God that led them in the desert. It was the presence of God that provided the cloud. It was the presence of God that provided the pillar of fire. It was God in the beginning, and it was going to be God in the middle, and it was going to be God at the end. I came all the way from Las Vegas to tell somebody here in Manchester, keep your eyes on God. Keep your eyes on God. Keep yourself in the presence of the Lord. It was God's presence in the beginning. It was going to be God's presence that allowed them to cross over. God's presence. God's presence. 
How are you able to do what you do? God's presence. I'm not that smart, but God's presence. I'm good looking, but that's another story. I'm not that smart, but God's presence. It's God's presence. It was God's presence that led them, and it was going to be God's presence that helped them cross over. It's God, man. I think about what God's doing in Vegas. It's God. It's God to to be where God has us. It's God, man. To have a big church, to have favor with the city, to launch out other churches. It's God. It's not me. It's the presence of God. Someone say amen. Amen. It was God and still be God. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5 through 6, Joshua is telling the people to make, this is going to be so good right here, get ready. He tells the people to make the necessary preparations that are needed in order to cross over. Listen, 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 listen. Your promise is there, but you have to make the necessary preparations to cross over. Sometimes people want the manifestation of God, but they don't want to do the preparation. Oh, I want God, but we don't prepare ourselves. Oh, I need God, do this. But God says, can't change this about yourself. Oh, God, I need you to work in that area. And God says, well, I need you to do this, and we don't want to do it. We want the manifestation of God, but we don't want to do the preparation. We don't want to change. We want to be stubborn. Only in Las Vegas. You good? You all right? You good? I want the manifestation of God, but I don't want to do the preparation for it. It doesn't work that way. You know, before I came here, I was fasting a lot back at home. The preparation for the manifestation. The preparation For the power of God, the preparation to see somebody impacted, the the preparation to see somebody, even if it's just one person this morning in your chair, and all of a sudden you get a revelation, and you say, man, that message was for me. I got a revelation. I've been on the other side of my promise for too long. You promised me a good marriage. You promised me a calling. You promised me my children. I've been waiting too long. I got a revelation, and now I'm crossing over. Crossing over into my promise. Crossing over into my promise. I'll make the necessary preparations. So prepare yourself. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow. I'm going to blow your mind. I like that phrase better. Say, prepare yourself. (laughs) This is how God speaks to me. Prepare yourself, consecrate yourself, because tomorrow I'm going to blow your mind. Is God still blowing our mind? Let me ask this side. Is God still blowing our mind? Or is it just, uh, God's cool. God's cool. Or is he still blowing your mind? <laughs> so prepare yourself because tomorrow I'm going to blow your mind. So good. Prepare yourself. You wouldn't go on a first date smelly. Well, maybe some of us, I don't know. Right? You wouldn't go on a first date if you didn't first get a fresh cut. Right? If you're a girl, you wouldn't go on a first date if you didn't get some more weave. (laughs) 
I say that because my wife puts weaves in her hair, so I could say it. That's not her real long blonde hair. Come on, somebody. Some of it is, not all of it. <laughs> right? We we would we wouldn't go. We wouldn't go on a first date if we didn't prepare ourselves. Unless you want to be the stinky boy. Come on, the dingy guy. No, you would prepare yourself. I'm trying to make it practical. You would prepare yourself for that encounter. That's what God was telling the children of Israel. He was saying, prepare yourself. Get ready for what I'm going to do. So Joshua tells the people, prepare yourself because God is going to blow our mind. Listen, I came to tell people this morning that you may have started from the bottom. That's the title of this message, started from the bottom, now we're here. I was going to come out to a Drake beat, but I might be too much. Started from the bottom, now we're here. I don't know if that's too worldly, sorry. I'm American. You might have started here, but you're not going to stay there. You might have started here, but you're not going to stay there. You're not going to stay there. There's a new territory. There's a, there's a promise. There's a... Come on, somebody. There's a miracle. Come on, somebody. There's a breakthrough. There's a, there's a set free. There's a, there, there's a blessing. There's a, come on, somebody. You, you may be here, but you're not going to stay there because you're crossing over. You're crossing over. How many believe that this morning? I believe that for my own life. I believe that. When I was younger, I used to think Olive Garden was for rich people. They're like, what is Olive Garden? It's an Italian restaurant in the United States. And when I was little, I thought only rich people ate there. But now that I grew up, I realized that Olive Garden Garden is horrible. On the scale of Italian food, it's on the bottom. I would drive by in the car and my parents would be like, look at all the rich people eating at Olive Garden. Now I just drive by Olive Garden. Come on, somebody. Because you might have started here. You might have started here. But you're crossing over to get. Somebody clap a little bit. Come on, I got about another hour and a half. Come on, clap a little bit. Your pastor said to be myself, so I'm going to be myself. That preparation, I call that the gap. G-A-P, the gap. Not the brand, the store. The gap. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, at the appointed time, at the appointed time. So in the preparation part, before stepping over to the promise, there is the gap, the preparation that God does within our life. I believe for this church here, because this message is for you guys, that in the gap, God wants to grow your capacity. Watch this. Your capacity, your creativity, and your intelligence. I got this in prayer. He said, I'm, I want to grow their, watch this, their capacity to handle more. God wants to give you more. So he, wants, he has to grow your capacity to handle more. 
He, he wants to grow your creativity. Come on, somebody. That when people walk in this church, it blows their mind. They're like, wow, I never, ever experienced anything like this before in my life. When they walk in, they're like, wow, that's so creative. That's so different. That's so unique. That's not like the church down the street. That's not like that other ministry. There's something different here. So he wants to grow our capacity, our creativity, and our intelligence. He wants to give us wisdom because of the day and hour that we live in. We live in a crazy time. Come on, somebody. In our church in Vegas, we got everybody coming to church right now. Packed out, two services. We got everybody coming. And when I mean everybody, I mean everybody. Guys marry to guys, girls marry to girls, bringing their children that they, that they adopted or whatever. I mean, we got it all. So it takes intelligence. You got to be smart in, in how you're handling the more that God is going to bring you. Intelligent. The gap. See, the Ark of the Covenant was going to be placed in the water until all the people got in the river. Then he would stop the water and dry everything up. So he said, put the Ark in the water. Have everybody get in the water. Come on, somebody. He didn't dry the water up first and then say, now get in the water. He said, get in the water. Come on now. When I was studying that, it was a, a type of Jesus within our life. It's how God works in the believer's life. He gets in the trial with us. He gets in the circumstance with us. A lot of times God does not remove the trial. He leaves the trial there. He leaves the circumstance there. He leaves the raging water there. He leaves the overflowing water there. He leaves the problem there. He says, I'm going to be with you in that situation. Have you ever asked God to remove something and he doesn't? Isn't that what Paul did? Paul said, remove this thorn. And God said, no. Then he asked him two more times. And God said, no, two more times. You ever been there or is that just me? You ever been there and said, God, remove it. And God says, no, I'm not going to remove it. I'm, I'm going to be with you in it. That, that's what that river represented. That river represented the trials of life. It represented opposition. It represented problems. It, it, it represented the, the, how life could be overwhelming. But God said, no, 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 get in the water. I've learned something in my 28 years of serving God that sometimes you got to get your feet wet. Sometimes you got to get your feet wet to get your promise. <laughs> You gotta get your feet wet sometimes if you want to get your promise. Well, I want my promise, but everything to be neat and purty and all put together. <laughs> Sorry, God doesn't work like that. Sometimes, for my wife, I think he does, not for me. <laughs> everything is always all purty for my wife and for me, it's like, really, God? I got to go through another trial to get a promise? You just give them to my wife. It's a type of Jesus in our life. How he works in our lives, how he comes down into our lives and into our situation. Why didn't God just stop the water first? It was because God wants to see faith in action. He gives us a promise, and he says, now I want to see your faith in action to obtain the promise that I gave you. 
Are you still with me this morning? How many got a promise from God? If you got a promise from God, lift your hand. So he said, I'm going to give you a promise, but I want to see your faith in action. I want to see momentum in your life. I want to see you going after the promise. That's why you got to be in church. Come on, somebody. So I got to go back there and buy some food. No, seriously, it's faith in action. It's faith in action. Once I heard that she was going, I gave. Why? Faith in action. I've learned that a long time ago. I learned my pastor said he told me that a long time ago. You got to put your faith into action. And when you put your faith into action, then you see the promise come to pass. So he didn't dry it up first. He said, no, I want to see your faith. I'm going to do it anyways. Come on, God's like, I'm going to do it anyways, but I want to see your faith. I'm going to give you the promise anyways, but I want to see your faith. I'm going to be God because I'm God and I'm a good God. Come on, somebody. But I want to see your faith. Do we still have faith for the promise? Or is it taking too long now? Oh, the promise is taking too long. I don't really have faith anymore. No, 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 no. Got to stir it up. Got to stir up that faith. Another reason why, not just our faith in action, but also that we don't forget and everyone else around us knows that it was God who did it in our life. Do you know that when God does a miracle in your life, other people get blessed by it? I'm being, so, I'm being so honest. The miracles that God has done in my life, people around my life have been blessed by it. My mom got saved. 76 years old. My father got saved. 76 years old. My mother-in-law got saved, 76 years old. My sister got saved, and they all moved to Las Vegas. Why? Because they saw the miracle working power in my life. And they said, if God did it for a widow, then God can do it for God did it for my son, he'll do it for me. If God did it for my brother, he'll do it for me. If God did it for my son-in-law, he'll do it for me. Can you imagine my whole family's getting saved now? 28 years I've been praying for them. How long? 28 years I've been praying for them. And now they're all, and not only getting saved, but moving to Las Vegas. My mother-in-law moved down the street for me, pray for me. She's literally around the corner. I'm like, where's your mom at? Never mind. I know where she's at. She's at, she's at her mom's. Nikki Cruz came to my church and preached on a Sunday morning. My father was there in the front row. Nikki was getting ready to end. Getting re literally getting ready to hand me the mic. And then he goes, Mondo, where's your dad at? I go, he's right there in the front row. And he said, come up here, sir. I've never seen my dad cry in my entire life. Ne I've never seen him cry. He took two steps up the stairs and broke down, man. And Nikki prayed for him. And if you know Nikki Cruz, he's so funny. He tells my dad, I'm your spiritual father now. And he says, and if you don't go to church every Sunday, I'm going to punch you in the face. If you know Nikki, that sounds like Nikki. Sometimes God does that because other people around us, other people around us see the miracle taking place. Can somebody say amen? amen. Worship he could come. I got about seven more points. 
Also, I believe God does miracles in our lives today so that we are fully prepared for the future challenges. I'll say that again. God does miracles in our life today for the future challenges that are ahead. Because this is crazy, is they were going to cross the Jordan River into the promise, but they were still going to face difficulties. It wasn't like they were going to cross in, we made it. <laughs> Here we are, man. We're in the splendor, and we're, everybody's happy. No, there was giants, man. There were still going to be battles that had to be fought. But look at how good God is. God was showing them, man, I've been with you every step of the way. I was with you in the desert. I was with you at the sea. I was with you at the Jordan. That was God's way of manifesting himself into those things. Why? Because he's an invisible God. You can't see him. So he manifests himself into those miracles, into the pillar, into the fire, into the ark. Come on, somebody. He's an invisible God. We say, no, I'm, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show you that I'm real. So I really believe that, that God does miracles in our life today that are preparing us for what's in the future. Some people don't make it. Like I said, I've been serving God now 28 years. Not a long time, but I'm getting there. And I've seen a lot of people, man, with promises. And they forget. They forget. They forget. It was God. It's God. It's God. It's God. Man, I've been pastoring now 16 years, and it's been hard. There's been good times, but it's been hard. When my kids weren't serving the Lord, uh, my son wasn't serving God, and we, we tussled sometimes. Come on, man. Oh, thank God that he's sold out for the Lord. He's actually preaching this morning back at home. He's a regional leader. He's holy. <laughs> He's a holy young man. That guy's holy. I like to watch mobster movies. He'll be like, I don't know if you should be watching that, Dad. I'm like, go back to your room, man. This is my, this is my free time right here. All right, I don't know. This is my house. Go. Verse 14 through 17, not only did, did the people break camp, but when they reached the water, it was overflowing and running hard. The Jordan was overflowing. So when the children looked around, they were surrounded, nowhere to go. They couldn't even swim through it. It was too rough. But as soon as the priest put the ark into the water, it stopped and it dried up. Listen, church, never, ever go before God. Never go before his presence. Right? If God's not there, I don't want to be there. If God's not leading the way, I don't want to go. Even coming here, it was God. It was God. My friend, Pastor Paul, and even Pastor Lou in Africa, they've been asking me to come. And it just hadn't happened, and now it happened. And we're here today, and Monday we fly to Johannesburg and going to preach in Pretoria, Mitchell's Plain, Port Elizabeth, then fly over to Cape Town and preach in Cape Town. And There's God. God's leading the way. God's not there. I don't want to go. I don't want to be there. Listen, church, many of you are going to go into new territory. A new place of leadership, a new place in your marriage, 
a new place for your family, for your schooling, for your career, for your business. And we need the presence of God. I have a lot of business owners in our church. And I tell them, you got to keep God's presence in your business, man. They say, well, how do you know it's not? I said, I'll just look at your giving. If you're a business owner and you're making a lot of money, you should be a big giver. And if you're not giving big and you're making a lot of money, then God's not there. you got to fix it. Just like the children of Israel, they were guided by the presence of God from the beginning, and it was going to be God guiding them again to their promise. The promise is possible. This is it. This is, this is where it's at. To get all of us to believe that the promises of God are possible for our life. I said it earlier, we all start with momentum. It's a surge. It's a force. When we started life, we started with momentum. We started with possibilities. Life is life. And I'm going to end with this. Life is life. And life has a way of trying to erase the promises from us. It's so true. Death in our family, haters, letdowns. Man, there's just so much. I could go on and on. And life will try to use those things to erase the promise from our life. But we have to remember God gave it to us. And if God gave it to you, nobody could take it away. There's still so many promises. That, you know, I, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. It's a promise God gave me. We're on the radio. We've been on the radio. But God told me that our church was going to be on television. It's another promise. There's still promises. There's still promises. There's still promises. But life will try to erase those promises, man. Come on. And look back and say, I was better over there. <laughs> it was better over there. It wasn't better over there. Stop lying to yourself. It was better when I didn't come to church. No, it wasn't. You're lying to yourself. It was better when I wasn't involved. No, it wasn't. You were boring. You were a boring person before you got involved in church. You just went to work, went home. Went to work, went home. Boring. God didn't save us to live that type of life. He said, I saved you to put a promise in you. Come on, clap. I saved you to put a promise in you. I saved you to put a promise in you. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to pray for people. I'm an okay preacher, but I have a gift on my life, and that's to pray for people. Maybe sickness is holding you back. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's a physical thing holding you back from the promise. God wants to set you free today. Do you know in our church that we've been seeing people get healed of cancer? A lady had a lump on her neck. Cancer. Sister Vicky, cancer. It's summertime. She's wearing a turtleneck. She said, look, Pastor. She's a police officer. I, they diagnosed me with cancer in my neck. We prayed for her. It disappeared. No, it really did. I said, go to the doctors, get another MR, MRI, whatever they call them, and have them look. And they did it, and there was no cancer at all. Gone. Gone. Another lady was blind, kneeling down on this side of the stage. I was getting ready to end service. Her son cries out and says, Pastor, my mom's blind. I went back and looked at her. Her eyes were like blue, 
glossy, cut like covered with something. Said a prayer for her. By the time I got back to the pulpit, she screamed out real loud, I can see. There's a gift. It's not me, it's God. But there's a gift on my life to pray for people. Do we still believe in miracles? Yes. How many need a promise from God? You need. You're like, Pastor, I need a promise. Can you do me a favor? Can you come up here real fast, as fast as you can? Come, 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 come. You need a promise. Come, 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 come. I'll pray for those that already have a promise, but I want to pray for those first that need a promise. Come, 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 come.